Good day, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us. This is Breaking News Clinical Trial Results in Pulmonary Medicine. The session is being held in advance of the American Thoracic Society 2020 virtual conference, which will be held in August. We have a very exciting lineup of late breaking clinical trials and a really wonderful lineup of presentations and I'm excited to welcome you to our program today. First, we'll be hearing from Dr. Klaus Rabe on the ethos study in COPD. Next up, we'll be hearing from Dr. James Chalmers on the Willow study in bronchiectasis. Following that, we will have Dr. Stephen Nathan, who will be presenting results from the pulmonary hypertension increase study. And then finally, Dr. David Badesh will be presenting uh, more information on Sotatercept for the treatment of pulmonary hypertension. So thank you for joining us and welcome. At the end of each presentation, we will have a brief opportunity to uh, allow you to ask questions of our presenters. Uh, today, I will be uh, joined by Dr. Uh, Jennifer Taylor Kuzar, who will be helping to moderate the session with Dr. Chalmers. Dr. Martin Kolb, who will be helping to moderate questions for Dr. Nathan. Uh, and Dr. Stephen Kaywood, who will be helping to moderate uh, the session for Dr. Patesh. So thank you. So I'd like to go ahead and move into our first talk, uh, which is going to be presented by Dr. Klaus Rabe. The title of the talk is Inhaled Triple Therapy at Two Glucocorticoid Doses in Moderate to Severe COPD, uh, the ETHOS study. I know I'm very excited to, to hear what he has to say, and I'm sure you will be too. Uh, welcome, Dr. Rabe. Thank you, all of those uh, who have dialed in to see this presentation live on the ATS in a rather um, unusual format. Um, it gives you great pleasure, nevertheless, to present on behalf of all my co-authors uh, a clinical trial addressing um, the efficacy of a single inhaler triple combination therapy containing bedesonide, glycoporolate, and formotrol in treating uh, COPD, remarkably with a regimen that involves two steroid dose levels, and this trial is called ethos. As it is requested and really recommended, I give you the chance to look at my uh, potential conflicts of interest and my commercial interest that may be irrelevant to this presentation. Nevertheless, I would try obviously to give you the most balanced account I can give you on the data from the trial that will be published in parallel uh, very soon uh, for you to read in detail. With this, let me introduce the background of the trial that we conducted. As you all know, triple therapy with an ICS, a LAMA, and a LABA is a recommended therapy for the treatment of patients with COPD. And it is recommended for individuals that are symptomatic and or have exacerbations. But it's not the only way to treat individuals with COPD. There are other combinations as well, including a LAMA-LABA and an ICS-LABA. What we have done in the past We've been looking at the triple combination um, that is subject to, in this trial as well to look at um, exacerbations of COPD, um, but primarily in the Kronos trial that you can see in a 24-week study uh, looking at lung function um, as well. And what we, can see, what, what we saw is that uh, the triple combination in fact has efficacy and improves lung function, it reduces exacerbations. So we thought that we would have to conduct a larger trial to compare this triple combination with other available and recommended uh, combinations of drugs um, that you would see in the next slide. What we conducted is a, a trial that is large. Um, it uh, involves several thousand individuals, as you can see. It's a double-blind trial over 52 weeks, and it compares triple therapy with bodesonide, glucoparolate, and formotrol to, if you want, a LAMA-LABA combination in red, that is glycoporolate formotrol, and an ICS-LABA combination, which is bodesonide formotrol, which you can see in orange. Notably, and for the first time, the triple combination is being administered at two different doses, with 320 and 160 micrograms of the steroid bodesonide. Importantly, it means in direct comparison that we are able also to compare a lower dose, a 
of a steroid, 160 micrograms, to a higher dose in the ICF lava combination in terms of its propensity to reduce exacerbations. Ethos is also the first trial of a triple therapy that looks at steroid doses at two different dose levels. And it involves a stratification on blood eosinophils prospectively, which makes it all the more interesting, at least in my view. Now on the next slide, you can see that the inclusion criteria are the inclusion criteria that you are used to. It's individuals with 40 to 80 years of age. Um, individuals should have had symptoms, a CAT score above 10. Uh, they obviously uh, were, were former smokers. They were on at least two inhaled meds and therapies, importantly, six months or more prior to screening, and they had a history of severe or moderate exacerbations, stratified a little bit for the severity of lung function impairment, less or above 50% predicted. Importantly, the CLE exclusion criteria in included the current diagnosis of asthma. So no individual with asthma was actually allowed other than the um, exclusions given there, other one antitrypsin deficiency, obviously, or any other clinically significant uncontrolled conditions, which is quite natural for such a big trial, such as this one. So for the um, baseline characteristics, just in summary, I'm highlighting here the most important parts are showing you that the lung function impairment was very well matched. Um, it also shows you the distribution of therapy of entry, um, and it shows you the eosinophil counts, which luckily almost uh, resulted in a 40-60 um, um, distribution of the two groups, making it amenable to a, a proper analysis. For the presentation, uh, we've chosen to guide you through color codes. Blue, dark, and lighter is the BGF triple combination. The red one always is the GFF, glycoporolate, formotrol combination, and BFS, podesonide, formotrol, is always shown in, in orange to guide you through the presentation of these. The primary endpoint of our trial was the rate of moderate to severe CBD exacerbation of 52 weeks. Green in this slide indicates highly significant results. The higher dose and the lower dose of the triple combination all um, um, resulted in a highly statistically significant reduction of moderate severe exacerbations. So for all comparisons, the primary endpoint of this trial was met. If you look at secondary exacerbation endpoints, and you look at, again, at the high and the lower dose of BGF, significant results were, uh, were obtained for most of the comparison. It was always significant, significant for the time to first moderate severe exacerbation. Only at the rate of severe exacerbations, and even though this is a large trial, the number there is limited, not all endpoints were hit, as statistically significantly, albeit always with a very clear trend. Importantly, a whole range of secondary symptoms and quality of life endpoints were met. These secondary symptoms and quality of life endpoints included an MCID for the SGRQ total score. It included a change from baseline rescue medication, a dyspnea score TDI, the change from baseline SGRQ, and a change from baseline in exact total score of 52 weeks. As you can see, the higher and the lower dose always resulted in clinically and statistically highly significant results in direct comparison in this 52-week trial. One secondary endpoint deserves special attention, and this secondary endpoint is the time to death of in all cause mortality. What this slide shows is that there is a graded response over 52 weeks of mortality, with GFF having the highest mortality in the direct comparison and the high dose of the triple combination having the lowest mortality. In fact, if you look at the bottom, the difference between the high dose of BGF MDI versus GFF was statistically significant with a risk reduction of 46%. And this is something for the first time showing that it's the higher dose rather than the lower dose that affords the statistical benefit, albeit if you look at the trends in, in um, both of these comparisons, you realize that the, higher, the lower dose has some effect, but the effect on mortality lies with the higher dose.
That gives me uh, the chance to actually directly compare the higher and the lower dose in our trial, which is probably one of the highly significant and most specific points of novelty in this trial as well. So if you look at the higher dose of BGF-320 and compare it to the lower dose, you realize that they both hit in gray the uh, significant effect on severe exacerbations and the time to first moderate to severe. In severe exacerbations, the MCAD for health-related um, uh, quality of life, uh, the focal score, here it seems that there is a trend. There's a trend always for the higher dose, but this is only a trend in that, given, making it very interesting to translate this into tr clinical treatment recommendations for the higher or the lower dose in a given individual, and that is, will be open for deliberations of guideline development. Since I introduced the eosinophil in the, in the beginning, I would want to share the data with you on the eosinophil distribution in our cohort. Please note that about 15% of these patients, none of them with a diagnosis of asthma, had an eosinophil count about 300 cells um, per um, uh, millimeter cube, um, and the majority were in the area of 100 to 300 cells, which you would understand. If you look at the, the, the graph, this data of ethos, confirm to some extent the data that have been generated in the past already. About 250 eosinophils um, per uh, millimeter cube, you start to see a separation where steroid-containing drugs will actually afford a better control of exacerbation than a drug combination such as GFF that would result into a higher exacerbation rate with high eosinophil numbers, making it again very interesting to understand where the role and the positioning of steroid-containing triple combinations for the treatment of COPD might lie and should lie in the future. Interesting enough, as you could see, a lot of individuals were having steroids as a treatment option before they were enrolled in the trial. And other trials have always been criticized that maybe some of the effect that you see is related to steroid withdrawal in those individuals that were on steroids already. This analysis that you see now actually uh, accounts for this and makes it quite clear that the superiority of a triple combination in a high and the low dose was irrespective of the use of ICS at screening. You can see in the top half, 6,846 individuals were in ICS, 1663 were not. The rate ratios and the difference in the primary uh, endpoint the rate of moderate severe exacerbation reduction was independent of prior ICS use, very notably. To be complete, um, the treatment emerging adverse events included um, a number of um, relevant endpoints, and one of them obviously is related to adverse events that lead to early discontinuation. Here there was no difference between the four groups. Deaths, there was no difference between the four groups. Conf as, a, as, a, as, an, as an adverse event, pneumonia. In pneumonia, we could see and confirm that steroid containing drug combinations that have been used compared to GFF had a higher risk of causing pneumonia and that resulted in more pneumonia events per thousand patient years at, at, at you see the bottom. The MACE events, as recorded there, were slightly higher in the GFF containing combinations and were very small in those on triple therapy and then ICS lava. To conclude this short presentation and uh, to illustrate the data that you will find in the full publication, um, triple therapy with budesonide glucoprolated for motorol at the higher and the lower dose had significantly uh, re reducing effects on the rate of moderate severe exacerbations. And this is the primary end of the trial, which was fully met. The comparators were a LAMA-LABA and an ICS-LABA combination, as you've seen. Interesting, both doses of the triple therapy significantly improved symptoms and health-related quality of life with us both, with us both dual therapies. And I personally believe this is worth reporting since we've been very much concentrating on exacerbations, obviously, in the past, but obviously, symptom control and improvement of health related quality of life becomes more and more atten attention, and I think we need to discuss this. Very interesting, only the higher dose of BGF reduced or caused mortality versus the lama lava therapy. This reduction was 46%. Uh, it's quite a sizable and significant reduction um, if you understand the size of this trial. 
and it gives uh, a very interesting insight as to the dose scheme that's been used in CPT treatment uh, in, in the long term. Very interestingly, and I introduced this also in the first uh, slides, it's the first time that we could show that, in fact, for the steroid reduction, a triple therapy that has half the dose of the steroid uh, compared to a common ICS lava combination has had, in fact, great efficacy and the exacerbation endpoint. And again, this will inform uh, us clinicians and the medical community as to most probably use these drug combinations in the future. We thank, obviously, all patients, the families, and the teams of investigators that are involved. This is a large trial. It's a huge trial that takes a lot of effort and a lot of dedication. We also are grateful for all the medical support, the writing support, and all the management support that we received. And um, with this, I would want to leave it here. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Klaus, for that excellent presentation. And we've already got some interesting questions coming in, and I've got a few of my own as well. So our first question is uh, that uh, AZ has been saying for years that budesonide causes no increased risk of pneumonia. How do you reconcile this with data from ethos? Well, you've seen the data. Um, large trials, such as this one, uh, with very firm selection by, um, rules, including individuals with steroids in the past, um, have shown that this triple combination um, and the ICS lava had a higher risk. It is something that we found in Kronos as well, by the way. Um, so we have to say that there are individuals um, that where you have to, to balance the benefit of, of exacerbation against the risk of pneumonia. There are some parameters that we know um, is, uh, that is more, more relevant, uh, people that have had pneumonias in the past, but yes, the data are quite, cl quite clear. It's not a huge number of events in this, but there's a disbalance, as we've seen in other trials. Yeah, I think uh, this is definitely interesting. It definitely adds some information for us to, to think about when we're trying to do risk-benefit uh, analysis. So speaking of that, there are a couple questions here that relate to how we're going to use these drugs in clinical practice. Um, one of them is, uh, which patients will you use the 160 budesonide, um, the triple combination? How are you going to decide who gets the low dose triple and who gets the high dose triple? Yeah, that's 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 a tricky one, and I think it's a good question. Um, the reason why I personally believe, well, I'm I'm biased, that the reason why I personally believe this trial is good is to look at the two different doses because there were no data about this so far. And um, it is quite convincing to see that if you look at the exacerbations only, um, there is quite a good evidence that the lower dose actually does, does the trick. Um, it is very interesting to see that probably on the secondary endpoint of mortality, we will sort of you know, report this obviously in more detail in a, in a subsequent publication. That's the higher dose that actually sort of you know, is, is better than, than, than the lower one. Um, I guess that um, from the data that we have from Pronos, from the earlier trial, it will be the 320 dose, uh, be the recommended dose. That's where the data are, that's where the filing has been. And this is what very likely is going to be in the label uh, for, uh, for the treatment of COPD. But it remains to be seen in subsequent trials, you know, how low can you go and what endpoints would you hit and which ones don't you. This opens up a whole new area now in looking at sort of, you know, playing with dosing regimen, risk benefit, which endpoint, uh, how safe can it be? So this uh, is not a question from a listener, it's actually a question from me. How are, uh, how are you going to uh, decide then which are your patients that should be on triple, which should be on dual bronchodilator? And I think the corollary to that is, is there a role now for ICS LABA? Yes, um, I think that's a, that's a very good point. First of all, I think this is the, another trial that gives a clear indication that eosinophilia, even in trials when we try to very selectively exclude asthmatics, individuals with higher numbers of eosinophils have a, a higher risk of having exacerbation events, one. Second, they would benefit from a steroid-containing drug regimen because there you would see that if you don't have it on board with a lama lava, the risk goes up for exacerbation. So I mean that's criteria number one. 
Criteria number two is what this trial has not done, bracket, yet, bracket. I personally believe that individuals that have a very predominant emphysematous phenotype, people that have high residual volumes, are hyperinflated, are probably are skinny, have very thin skin. These are still the individuals where I try to find reasons not to treat them with an inert corticosteroid, but that's my, that's my white coat sort of opinion about this. There's no formal trial that has addressed this as yet. But I do believe that all these individuals with a high symptomatic load, with frequent exacerbations, with some form of inflammation being detected also in the peripheral blood, with an impairment of lung function, also very severe ones, these are the ones that seem to benefit from triple combinations better and more than from lama lava and to ics lava that confers a little bit with other data that we've obtained so far but i think the picture is evolving more and more that this is for these individuals is a is, is a real proper treatment option and i think we will go this way more and more so there's a question here that relates to that and you may not be able to answer it but, but the listener uh, is curious what was the effect of triple therapy on mortality across eosinophil strata? Were you, were you able to look at that? No, not yet. I think it's a very, thank you for that question. It's very smart, if I may say so. Um, I honestly, I confess that I was quite surprised to see that clear separation that I've shown, that I've shown you. And 46% reduction in mortality versus a lama lava, that's a window that is sizable. So we have to look at this in detail. And as I said, uh, these data will be scrutinized for a very detailed analysis and will form the basis of a subsequent and separate publication because I think the data are very important. I think we have another large trial that looked at triple therapy that showed the same sort of trend. And we try, we we'll actually include as many data points as possible because if that holds true, and we know the indicators for that in a given individual, I think that will be very relevant for clinical treatment decisions. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. So we've got a couple questions here that relate to some of the details. We have one person who's got a lot of interest in some of the details about the study design. And we have a question on whether the sample size uh, calculations were based, um, took into account the multi-centric, multi-ethnic nature, Asia Pacific versus US versus Europe. I think you and I both know that when you look at some of the clinical trial data, we see differences in eosinophils, we see differences in exacerbation rates, even differences in response to ICS when looking at different geographic regions. To what extent um, did the trial plan for that? And have you done any of those subgroup analyses yet? Yes, I think it's a very relevant question. I, some years ago, I was so naive as to think it's either exacerbation, yes or no, and that's it, you just count the events. I had to learn over many years that this is a complex process of modeling correcting for regionality, age, pre-medication, and so on and so forth. Yes, that has been done. Uh, is that iterative process perfect to reflect every form of uh, influence on a global scale? No, but it actually does it, and it did it in this, in this trial. You will find this in the publication, in the appendix, in more detail. But obviously, if you try to model and to find a primary endpoint and a sample size of that magnitude, you will have to take account that there are factors that will influence the signal by regionality, ethnicity, seasonality, and so on and so forth. That's yes, that has been done. Okay, the questions are pouring in. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to get to them, but let me try to look at some of the more interesting ones. Now, the, I would say the prior data on this is split. Did you see any difference? Uh, were, were eosinophils able to differentiate who got pneumonia? No, we, well, I'm, I don't know that yet. Um, I can tell you that um, this is a, a huge data set again. I mean, I, I showed you that um, the, 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 the uh, LIMES is 300 cells per microliter, 1,600 plus individuals were above that, excluding people with a diagnosis of asthma. More than 6,000 people were below that. Within those below that, we obviously have a strata of very low eosinophils to normal eosinophilia. Has it been related as yet that I could speak of it to, with, 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 a, with a firm voice in terms of relating to pneumonia? Not yet. Will it be done? Will it be presented? Promise. Okay, I'm getting the two minute time warning, so I'm gonna have to choose, choose my questions carefully here. Um, here's, I think, a really thought provoking question. 
as COPD is the progressive disease, would you recommend to intervene earlier with triple therapy based on this data? Well, if you choose your questions wisely, I choose my answers wisely. I think this is a million dollar question. Um, and I would have to say that if you believe that exacerbations, also more severe ones, drive progression of disease, and I happen to believe, as you do, that they do, if you have an indication that in a large trial you could see a survival benefit very early on in the trial, yes, it would be extremely intriguing to do exactly that. But to get it right, ethos is a trial in severe to very severe patients with COPD, where there's a high medical need. This will not include individuals where you would think and speculate that they will progress rapidly, but that is a, a wonderful trial to do. On this occasion, however, it's not very easy to design it because at that stage, people have not so many exacerbations. So you will need to have a huge sample size to actually so reflect that. Is it a smart question? Yes. Is it extremely important and to, as to when you will interfere? Yes. Did this trial answer this? No. This is a trial of severe exacerbations on severely affected patients with COPD, comparing the three options in guidelines that you could choose, trying to help you to give you get some clinical guidance. Okay, I'm giving I'm being given the yank here that we're uh, that time's up, but I'm going to answer the last question for you. And that is, when is the publication going to be available? And I'm being told that it's actually just gone live uh, on the New England uh, Journal of Medicine website. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rabe, for joining us. You're more than welcome. And thank you to all of you that have been on this, on this program. It's, it's, it's heartwarming to see, even though we all have to suffer from different um, circumstances, that you dial in, that you listen to us. It's really rewarding and uh, stay healthy and thank you for listening. Thank you. We now move on to our next talk by Dr. James Chalmers. The title of his talk is Phase Two Randomized Controlled Trial of DPP-1 Inhibitor Rensocatib in Patients with Bronchiectasis, the Willow Study. After his talk, we'll have a moderated Q&A session by Dr. Jennifer taylor Kuzar. Welcome, Dr. Chalmers. Thank you for the opportunity to present the results of our study, a phase two randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial of the DPP-1 inhibitor Brenzocitib in patients with bronchiectasis, the Willow study. My name is Professor James Chalmers. I'm the British Lung Foundation Chair of Respiratory Research at the University of Dundee. And I disclose that I have received uh, consultancy and grant funding from Insmed Incorporated who funded the Willow study. Bronchiectasis is a chronic disease characterized by symptoms of cough and sputum production, and particularly by frequent exacerbations, which we now know are related in many cases to uncontrolled neutrophilic inflammation. Pro-inflammatory neutrophil serine proteases, such as neutrophil elastase, are released into the airway of people with bronchiectasis through a process called neutrophil extracellular trap formation. Uh, and those proteases cause progressive lung damage, that contribute to both exacerbations and also to disease progression. What you can see on the right-hand side of this slide is results from a study we published in 2017 that showed that the risk of exacerbation in people with bronchiectasis was directly related to the concentration of neutrophil elastase in sputum. This provides some of the rationale for believing that blocking inflammation and particularly targeting neutrophil serine proteases may be associated with clinical benefits in people with bronchiectasis because prior research has demonstrated that elevated neutrophil serine proteases are associated with both exacerbation, poor quality of life, and lung function decline in this population. Dipeptidyl peptidase 1, or DPP1, also known as cathepsin C, is an enzyme that activates neutrophil serine proteases within developing neutrophils in the bone marrow. Neutrophil serine proteases, including neutrophil elastase, but also proteinase 3 and cathepsin G, need to be activated through the removal of an N-terminal dipeptide through the action of DPP1. Neutrophils are then released from the bone marrow that contain these activated neutrophil serine proteases 
which as I've mentioned, can contribute to lung damage in the context of chronic inflammation. Brenzocatib is an oral small molecule inhibitor of DPP-1, uh, which has been designed to interrupt the process of neutrophilic inflammation in the lung. DPP, blockade of DPP-1 prevents the activation of neutrophil elastase, proteinase 3, and cathepsin G, leading to neutrophils being released into the bloodstream that are otherwise functionally normal, but contain reduced amounts of activated neutrophil serum proteases. Preclinical studies have shown that uh, treatment with brenzocatib can reduce neutrophil elastase, proteinase 3, and cathepsin G, and phase one studies have demonstrated dose-dependent reductions in neutrophil elastase activity in blood in healthy subjects. And this provides the rationale for moving forward uh, to investigate this compound in patients with bronchiectasis. The Willow study was therefore designed to test the hypothesis that reducing neutrophil serine protease activity through the act action of Brenzocatib would reduce exacerbations and other relevant clinical endpoints. This is the design of the Willow study. After a screening period of six weeks, patients were randomized to one of the three treatment arms, stratified by the presence of Pseudomonas aeruginosa in sputum and chronic treatment with macrolides, both of which we know are important contributors to exacerbation frequency in bronchiectasis. Two doses of Brenzocative were tested in the study, a 10 milligram and a 25 milligram dose once daily, uh, compared to blinded placebo once daily. Following baseline visit and randomization, patients were seen at week two, week four, week eight, week 12, 16, 20, and 24 for the end of treatment. And there was then a four week treatment off drug uh, at the end of the study. So the overall treatment period was 24 weeks. The primary outcome of the study was the time to first exacerbation over the 24 week treatment period exacerbations being the key endpoint in bronchiectasis because of their strong relationship with both quality of life and mortality. The secondary endpoints were pulmonary exacerbation rate over 24 weeks, change in the quality of life bronchiectasis questionnaire, uh, particularly the respiratory symptom domain, which is a validated symptom tool for this disease, change in the post-bronchodilator percent predicted FEV1 over 24 weeks, and a change in sputum neutrophil elastase activity uh, over the study period. These are the major inclusion and exclusion criteria for the Willow study. We enrolled patients aged between 18 and 85 years, and patients were required to have uh, a BMI above 18.5 and to have both a clinical history consistent with bronchiectasis and a CT scan demonstrating bronchiectasis. Importantly, because the primary outcome is based on exacerbation, we enriched for exacerbating phenotypes by asking for at least two documented bronchiexis, bronchiexis exacerbations in the past 12 months. And patients had to be able to provide a sputum sample at screening and also have sputum color uh, graded as either mucopurulent or purulent on a validated sputum color chart, also at baseline. The reason for doing that is that sputum color is linked to neutrophil elastase concentration. And so this, along with the exacerbation history, enriches for patients more likely to experience exacerbations and have elevated neutrophilic inflammation. We excluded patients that have uh, uncommon treatable causes of bronchiectasis, including cystic fibrosis, hypogammaglobulinemia, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, NTM, and ABPA. Patients were also not allowed to be included if they had a primary diagnosis of COPD or asthma, but if those were secondary diagnoses, patients were allowed into the study. Patients would also be excluded if they had the rare condition Papillon-Lefebvre syndrome. This is a disease caused by uh, congenital absence of the gene coding for DPP-1, and this presents in childhood often with thickening of the skin, hyperkeratosis, uh, bacterial skin infections, and gingivitis and periodontitis. So patients with this condition would not be treated with a DPP-1 inhibitor. Uh, and when we get to safety, you'll see we also looked for manifestations of this condition uh, in the patient population. This is the flow of patients through the Willow study. 
We screened 416 patients, of which 116 were excluded, leaving 256 patients eligible for randomization to the study. 87 were randomized to placebo, 82 were randomized to brenzocative at the 10 milligram dose, 87 were randomized to 25 milligram dose, and overall more than 80% of patients completed the study. You can see that the drop rate was highest in the placebo arm. These are the baseline demographics and characteristics of the patients in the Willow study. And you can see that the population is very typical and representative of a bronchiectasis patient population, being uh, with a mean age of over 60 years and being predominantly female. We've highlighted some of the major severity characteristics in red, including Pseudomonas aeruginosa positivity that was present in approximately one third of the patients at baseline. Chronic macrolide use was present in 12 to 18% of the population. And between 28 and 41% of the patients were frequent exacerbators defined as having more than three exacerbations per year. Please note the slight imbalance uh, with more frequent exacerbators in the 25 milligram arm. We measured sputum neutrophil last days at baseline, and you can see there that the uh, patients were categorized according to the levels defined in our 2017 paper as those below the limit of quantification, those detectable but below 20 micrograms per mil, and those with very high levels above 20. And they were quite well distributed between those three groups. On to the results. To remind you, the primary outcome was the time to first bronchiectasis, bronchiectasis exacerbation. And the result of the study was that there was a significantly longer time to first exacerbation with brenzocative versus placebo at both dose groups. At the 10 milligram dose, the hazard ratio was 0 0.58 with a p-value of 0 0.029 and therefore statistically significant. And the difference was also significant for the 25 milligram group with a hazard ratio of 0 0.62. So the study met its primary endpoint at both doses tested. For the key secondary endpoint of the rate of exacerbations over 24 weeks, what you can see on the slide on the left is the proportion of patients experiencing at least one exacerbation. And here you can see that in the placebo group, almost half of the patients experienced an exacerbation over the 24 week treatment period. And this was significantly reduced to 31% in the brenzocative 10 milligram group and to one third in the 25 milligram group, both of which reached statistical significance. On the right, for the annualized exacerbation rates, the placebo group had a uh, frequency of 1.37 exacerbations per patient per year, which was significantly reduced by brenzocative 10 milligrams to a rate of 0 0.88 exacerbations per patient per year with a p-value of 0 0.041. The difference for the brenzocative 25 milligram group was not statistically significant uh, with a p-value of 0 0.167. Critically, both doses showed a reduction in sputum neutrophil elastase concentration uh, from four weeks that was sustained through the study. What you can see here in the uh, blue is the brenzocative 10 milligram group, and in the green is the 25 milligram group compared to the placebo, which you can see is stable through the study period. On the left-hand side, the y-axis is a log scale, and so the differences that you're seeing in sputum neutrophil elastase concentration are extremely high, uh, meaning that uh, brenzocative at both dose uh, ranges was su uh, successful in suppressing sputum neutrophilic inflammation. This was sustained through the 24 weeks of the treatment period, and during the four-week off-treatment period at the end, between 24 and 28 weeks, sputum neutrophil elastase returned to a baseline in both groups. Important validation of the relationship between neutrophil elastase concentration and exacerbations uh, is demonstrated through this analysis of the brenzocative treatment arms only. So this is pooling both doses together, and we've now compared patients according to whether they managed to achieve a complete suppression of neutrophil elastase during the study, which is in green, 
This means that they had at least one sputum sample post-treatment that was below the limit of quantification. In the orange are patients that did not have a suppressed neutrophil elastase concentration post-treatment. And you can see the marked difference in exacerbation frequency between these two groups with a hazard ratio of 0 0.28. What this says is that you're very unlikely to experience an exacerbation if, while on the brenzocative treatment, you manage to suppress your lung inflammation uh, to below the limit of quantification for neutrophil elastase. The study was not powered to show differences in uh, percent predicted FEV1, and the study was only 24 weeks in duration. Nevertheless, uh, FEV1 was measured as one of the secondary endpoints, and the data are considered encouraging because we saw in the placebo arm a reduction over the course of the study of minus 1.8%, uh, with a reduction of only minus 0.3% in both the 10 milligram and 25 milligram brenzocative arms. No statistical testing was performed here because of the statistical hierarchy, uh, because the secondary endpoint was not met. No uh, further p-values were calculated for these. Um, uh, nevertheless, the result is encouraging for long studies looking at lung function. Now on to safety. And here you see the comparison between the two brenzocative treatment groups and placebo. Treatment emergence ad adverse events resulting in treatment discontinuation were numerically higher in the placebo group, as were serious treatment emergent adverse events uh, at 22.4% in the placebo group compared to 13.6% and 11.2% in the two brenzocative treatment arms. The most common treatment emergent adverse events across all groups were cough headache, sputum increase, dyspnea, exacerbation of bronchiectasis, and diarrhea. And you can see that some of those adverse events were numerically higher in the brenzocative treatment groups. Adverse events of special interest were primarily those adverse events that are linked to the congenital syndrome papillon Lefevre, which I mentioned earlier. It typically results in uh, skin effects of hyperkeratosis and periodontitis, so dental effects. What was seen in the trial was a, a numerical increase in skin adverse effect, effects of special interest in both the 10 milligram and 25 milligram brenzocative arms, and also a numerically higher rate of dental adverse events in both treatment groups compared to placebo. Encouragingly, because of the history of drugs targeting neutrophilic inflammation, no signal was seen for increased infections in either brenzocative treatment groups. Patients were very carefully followed by a dentist during this study uh, and so had periodontal pocket depth measured and there were numerically higher uh, rates of patients uh, reporting or dentists reporting periodontal pocket depth greater than or equal to two millimeters in both treatment groups. But the clinically important uh, periodontitis, which is what's listed last on the slide here, was uh, relatively evenly distributed between the three groups. As I've mentioned, the key skin uh, effect of papillon Lefevre syndrome is hyperkeratosis, and only five adverse events have had hyperkeratosis were reported in the study, one in the placebo group, three in the brenzocative group at 10 milligrams, and one at the 25 milligram dose. These all resolved or improved at the end of the study without interruption to study drug. So in summary, brenzocative at a dose of 10 milligrams and at 25 milligrams significantly prolonged the time to first exacerbation, uh, which was the primary outcome, in addition to significantly reducing the annualized rate of exacerbations in the 10 milligram group. We also observed a dose-dependent reduction in neutrophil elastase levels in sputum, which supports the mechanism of action of this drug, uh, and uh, importantly showed a link between reducing neutrophil serine protease activity and clinical benefits in people with bronchiectasis. Both doses of brenzocative were well tolerated with an overall safety profile that's comparable with placebo. So this is a very important trial 
uh, a landmark trial for people with bronchiectasis because uh, this is a drug that for the first time appears to be able to target directly neutrophilic inflammation resulting in clinical benefits. And if these results are confirmed in a phase three trial, this may represent a novel non-antibiotic treatment to prevent exacerbations in bronchiectasis. And this is why I believe that this is so important. The vicious cycle model of bronchiectasis has been the way that we've looked at bronchiectasis uh, since it was first proposed by Peter Cole in, in the 1980s. And currently bronchiectasis guidelines recommend airway clearance and mucoactive therapies to target abnormal mucociliary clearance and macrolides and inhaled antibiotics to target bacterial colonization or infection. But we have no treatment at the moment that directly targets the neutrophilic inflammation that is the hallmark of bronchiectasis. And so the Willow study really is a landmark trial, uh, and I hope will lead on to a new non-antibiotic effective anti-inflammatory therapy for people with bronchiectasis. I want to finish by thanking all the families, uh, all of the patients, all of the study investigators and study staff that helped to deliver the Willow study. The Willow study was funded by INSMED, uh, and I also acknowledge medical writing support in preparing the presentation, as well as the co-investigators uh, for their help with developing uh, and delivering this study. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Dr. Chalmers, for that excellent presentation. We actually have a number of questions going in. For those of us who treat bronchiectasis, a safe and effective anti-inflammatory has really been the holy grail. So this is really exciting. So let me start with a couple that are about the trial design. So one of the questions is that the inclusion criteria stated the need to have two non-CF bronchiectasis exacerbations. How was this differentiated from a COPD or asthma exacerbation? So in other words, how did you guys define exacerbation? So the, the definition of exacerbation that was used in the study was the consensus definition that's been derived by the European and American registries, which requires six, three out of six symptoms and a prescription for antibiotics. Prior exacerbations were defined by the use of antibiotics, which is the standard method that's been used in previous trials. Um, and with regard to your question about differentiating from COPD and asthma, it's important to remember that primary diagnosis of COP or asthma was excluded from the study. Um, so these were patients that were having bronchiectasis exacerbations by definition. Okay, great. So the next question is really related to um, use and practice. So you mentioned the use of azithromycin in these, this group of patients. Um, what about the use of hypertonic saline and chronic inhaled antibiotics, and did that make a difference in how people responded? Um, so we've conducted a large number of different sub-analyses, as you can imagine, to look at uh, treatment response, and we didn't see any difference in treatment response according to the baseline use of macrolides. So the, um, at the 10 milligram dose and at the 25 milligram dose, the hazard ratios were very similar to the primary analysis when looking at macrolide users. So at the 10 milligram dose, both, both macrolide users and non-users had a hazard ratio of 0 0.6, which is consistent with the primary analysis, uh, and the same at the 25 milligram dose. So that, that's reassuring that patients got a benefit even if they were on uh, maintenance macrolide. The groups of patients receiving other therapies are much smaller and, and not really amenable to subgroup analyses. Um, but I think it's encouraging that this data uh, was derived from a population where we were adding brenzocative onto standard of care, and these patients were receiving standard of care therapies, including things like macrolides. Yeah, and that goes along with the next question. So obviously people with bronchiectasis have a high burden of therapy. And so that's one of the questions that people are asking is, do you just add this on to all of their other therapies or will this replace one of their therapies? Uh, I mean, I think this is something that we need to establish once we have results of a phase three study. It's really important we remember this is a phase two study. So we're not encouraging anybody to go out and use this therapy tomorrow for their patients. We need to establish the efficacy in a phase three study. But in terms of treatment burden, this is a, this is a once daily tablet, which compared to 
an inhaled antibiotic or a nebulized hypertonic saline, you and I both look after these patients and know that those therapies can be quite intensive. I think one of the attractions here is it's not an antibiotic, so we can overcome the resistance issue. And the burden of a once daily tablet is is negligible compared to some of the other therapies we give to bronchiexis patients. Great. So the next questions are about the phase three trial. So one, how are you going to choose a dose for the phase three trial, given the fact that the re efficacy results are pretty similar as were the side effects? So how will the phase three dosing be selected? And when do you expect to start that phase three trial? Um, so I, I can answer the second part first. So um, we've already announced that the phase three trial will be, be beginning towards the end of this year, COVID permitting. So I think the results that you've seen here are very encouraging and, and we really do need to move quickly into a phase three study because there, there aren't licensed therapies for bronchiectasis and, uh, and these data are very exciting. In terms of dose, um, I think you've seen the results here. It's, it's too small a study to differentiate the efficacy of, uh, of both doses. Uh, this, this study establishes that the drug works versus placebo, uh, but further studies will be needed to identify the optimal dose. Uh, and so that's an important consideration when we're thinking about the phase three design. Great. So the next question is about quality of life. You actually didn't report the quality of life results and they're wondering whether or not you did see a improvement in quality of life in those treated with drug versus placebo. Yeah. So there isn't an established uh, gold standard method of determining quality of life or symptoms in bronchiectasis. And so in this trial, we included a number of different measures. So we used the quality of life bronchiectasis respiratory symptom scale, which has been used in a number of studies. We used the St. George's respiratory questionnaire, and we also used the Lester cough questionnaire. We did not see any statistically significant benefit in respiratory symptoms on the QLB or on the St. George's respiratory questionnaire but we did see some encouraging uh, differences in some of the other domains of the QLB, uh, the non-respiratory symptom domains of the QLB. Again, this was a phase two study, not powered to show differences in symptoms, but some of those, some of those differences and some of those trends give us encouragement that there may well be symptomatic benefits in addition to the, um, the exacerbation benefits that we've shown. Okay, great. The next one um, is about a subset of the population again. So if you look at patients that didn't achieve the BLQ-PD response, is the drug efficacious compared to placebo? Um, yes, so we have, conducted, uh, we have conducted subgroup analyses looking at the baseline levels of sputum neutrophil elastase, uh, and the drug appears to be efficacious regardless of the, the baseline level of sputum neutrophil elastase. Um, and so it's more efficacious if you're able to achieve complete suppression of inflammation, um, but it doesn't appear that that's necessary for, for efficacy. Okay, great. So um, a number of people here um, clearly take care of people with CF and other forms of bronchiectasis. So they're asking what your opinion is about the use of this drug in people with chronic bronchi bronchitis, cystic fibrosis, other diseases that were excluded in this trial. So, I mean, I think if the question is about the use, we need to remember this is a phase two study and this drug is not available for use. In terms of its future therapeutic potential, I, th I think this is an incredibly exciting trial because we don't have any drug at the moment that directly targets neutrophilic inflammation. All of our, all of our drugs, including things like antibiotics, reduce inflammation indirectly by reducing drivers like, like infection. Uh, and so having a you said it in, in the introduction, something that directly reduces inflammation is the holy grail. Things like CXCR2 antagonism, and LTB4 antagonism, increased infections because they block neutrophil influx into the lungs. This, this mechanism seems to be able to suppress inflammation without reducing host response. And so that means it has potential in diseases like cystic fibrosis, diseases like COPD or neutrophilic asthma, but also potentially other neutrophilic diseases outside the lung, inflammatory bowel disease, for example. Um, so I'm very excited at the, at the biology that we're seeing here. Great. So it looks like we only have about two minutes left for questions. So um, 
They're asking also, similarly to the last talk, when do you expect the publication to come out for this data? Um, so I'm hoping that the data will be out within the next couple of months. Okay. Um, the next question, so we talked about use in other forms of bronchiectasis, and you may not have an answer to this, but since it's a popular topic right now, um, this person is asking about the update on the COVID-19 trial. Uh, okay, so the, 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 um, the person who's asking is uh, well informed. So we're conducting a UK trial of brenzocative in patients with COVID-19. So that trial began enrollment um, at the beginning of this month, and it's ongoing, and we're hoping for results before the end of the year. Fantastic. We definitely need another therapy on that line as well. Um, another question that just showed up. So it says, is the success of the drug related to any specific bacteria, or do you think it'll be useful regardless of which type of bacteria the person is chronically infected with? Yeah, so my, my prediction going into the trial was that this would work regardless of the bacteria because um, regardless of the bacteria, it's mainly the bacterial load that drives the level of inflammation. Uh, and that's what we saw in the subgroup analyses. So if you're pseudomonas colonized the, with the 10 milligram, your hazard ratio is 0 0.6. If you're not pseudomonas colonized, your hazard ratio is 0 0.5. So the, the benefit appears to be indistinguishable based on, on bacteria. It's all about the inflammation. And you know, in this trial, people with, for example, non-tuberculous mycobacteria were excluded. Do you expect that in the phase three trial, you'll also exclude them there, given that the number of people with bronchiectasis who are co-infected with NTM is fairly high? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a really good question because, so we, we think of NTM as being less of a neutrophil driven problem. It's obviously intracellular bacteria inside macrophages. Um, and so I think we've, we've done the right thing initially in targeting bronchiectasis with organisms like Pseudomonas with dominant neutrophilic inflammation. Um, but you're right that the burden of NTM associated bronchiectasis is high and we need to have a think about whether there may be a role for this drug in, in, uh, in that subpopulation as well. All right, great. I'm getting the notice that our time is up. So I'll say thank you very much for a great presentation and some awesome answers to the questions that people threw in. No, and thank you to everyone for dialing in. Have a great day. We will now be moving on to our third talk, which will be presented by Dr. Stephen Nathan. His talk is entitled Inhaled Tropostanol in Interstitial Lung Disease Associated Pulmonary Hypertension, The Increase Study. After his talk, we'll have a moderated Q&A session with Dr. Martin Kolb. Hello, thank you for joining us here today. I'm Dr. Stephen Nathan, and I'm going to be presenting the results of the INCREASE study, which was a study of inhaled troprostanol in interstitial lung disease associated pulmonary hypertension. These are my disclosures shown here. The INCREASE study was a phase three multi center, double blind, placebo controlled 16 week study of inhaled troprostanol versus placebo. The key inclusionary criteria are shown to the left. Patients had to have group three pulmonary hypertension with evidence of interstitial lung disease on CAT scan. They had to have right heart cath documented pulmonary hypertension based on the old definition. So a PVR of more than three wood units, a wedge pressure of 15 or less, and a mean PIP of 25 or more. They had to walk at least 100 meters or more. They could be on chronic therapy of some sort for the underlying lung disease, including the antifibrotics. And if they had a connective tissue disease, then they had to have an FPC of less than 70% of predicted to make sure that they had group three pulmonary hypertension as opposed to group one pulmonary arterial hypertension. In terms of exclusionary criteria, they couldn't have another cause of their pulmonary hypertension. They couldn't be on any pH therapy, no left-sided heart disease. They couldn't be on more than 10 liters of oxygen, no rehab within the, uh, the 12 weeks prior to randomization and no acute PE. These are the diseases that could be included in the clinical trial highlighted in blue. Most forms of interstitial lung disease, including any of the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, patients with chronic HP were, got in, patients with CTD, as mentioned, were allowed, as were patients with occupational lung disease and patients with combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema. 
The primary endpoint was the change in the six minute walk distance at 16 weeks, placebo corrected. Secondary endpoints include a change in the NT Pro BMP, time to clinical worsening, which was a composite of these four events shown over here, hospitalization due to a cardiopulmonary indication, a decrease in the walk distance of 15% or more, or cause mortality or lung transplantation. Other secondary endpoints include a change in the peak six minute walk distance at week 12, as well as change in the trough six minute walk distance at week 15. Exploratory endpoints include a change in the SGRQ, the St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire, change in the distance saturation product, change in the peak six minute walk distance from baseline to weeks four and eight, and um, safety events were also looked at. These are shown to the right. I'm not gonna read all of them. Um, two that I will highlight in particular include changes in pulmonary function tests, as well as exacerbations of the patient's underlying lung disease, as reported by the, by the principal investigator. This shows the study procedures and uh, endpoints, which are highlighted very nicely, color-coded over here in green for the primary, in yellow for the secondary, and in blue for the exploratory endpoints. Patients were started out at um, three, three breaths of the inhaled troposinol or placebo four times a day with a dose escalation to the target dose of nine breaths four times a day and a maximal allowable dose of 12 breaths four times a day. The groups were equally split and well matched. Perhaps a little bit of a difference here in terms of slightly more males in the placebo arm but for the most part, they were well matched throughout. In terms of etiology, you can see that 40 to 50% had one of the IIPs, 25% had a CPFE, CTD, ILD, 20 to 24%, and the rest constituted a minority. These patients were a pretty sick group. Most of them were on oxygen, around 70 to 73%. And uh, there were a few patients who were on antifibrotic therapy, assumedly, all of these had IPF, so around 17, 18% and around 26% in the placebo arm. Baseline six minute walk test, once again, attesting to a pretty sick group of patients around 254 and 265. PVR around six, quite elevated. NT Pro BMP also elevated, but equivalent between the two groups. The MPAP fell in the more severe range at around 36, 37, and the wedge was uh, normal. Lung function, these patients had moderate restrictive physiology as determined by both the FEC and the, TL, and, and the TLC. The DL was disproportionately reduced, which is not unexpected given the fact that they had underlying pulmonary hypertension. Screening, randomization and follow-up are shown over here. The groups were once again equivalently split with 163 in each arm. There were some premature discontinuations but this was equivalently balanced between the two groups, 33 in the triprosinol arm versus 35 in the placebo arm, but around 80% of the patients completed the clinical trial at 16 weeks. In terms of the primary endpoint, at week 16, inhaled triprosinol patients had a placebo-corrected median difference from baseline in peak six-minute walk of 21 meters, shown over here. The statistical method that was used for this primary analysis was the Hodges-Lehman methodology. This was also significant at week 12 and was also significant for the trough, for the trough measurement at week 15. Using a different statistical approach, the mixed model repeated measurement, these numbers were even more impressive at 31 meters at 12 weeks and 31 meters at week 16. Looking at the results based on uh, different demo demographic subgroups, first thing to note is that the majority of the point estimates were to the right of the line of zero. So they, it looked like all the groups responded for the most part. There um, was there was perhaps uh, one uh, point estimate to the left, which is patients who were underdosed at four to six breaths per minute. It is very nice though to see a dose response over here. As the patients got more, the greater their response in terms of the change in the primary endpoint. Looking at the subgroup analysis by age, there didn't appear to be a difference by age, uh, no big difference based on gender or the, their baseline six-minute walk test. 
if one looks at the etiology, it does look that like the patients with RIPs had a, a pretty robust response over here with a walk distance uh, difference of 32 meters. And similarly for the patients with underlying CTD, 39 meters as shown over here. Not unexpected, those patients with a higher PVR appear to have a slightly a greater benefit, but once again, the error bars cross over here, so not statistically significant between these two groups. In terms of the secondary and exploratory endpoints, there were significant differences observed with inhaled troprostanol in the NT pro BMP, reduction in time to clinical worsening, and as shown, the improvement in the peak six minute walk distance, as well as improvements in the trough six minute walk at week 15. There was no significant difference in the St. George's or the distance saturation product at week 16. Looking at the NT Pro BMP by uh, time period, once again, inhaled troprostanol resulted in a 38% reduction in the NT Pro BMP when compared to placebo at week 16. For the patients in the inhaled troprostanol group, this is the median. You can see that it goes down from 550 to 485 to 454. Whereas for the placebo arm, this goes up 420 to 528 to 590. What we're seeing with these columns are the interquartile range. But if one focuses on the, the median for the group, the triprosinal group goes down and the placebo group goes up in terms of the NT pro BMP. Time to first clinical worsening event, inhaled troprostanol resulted in a 39% reduction in the risk of clinical worsening compared to placebo, and this was significant at a p-value of 0.04. The absolute numbers are shown over here, 23% or 22.7% of the inhaled troprostanol group had clinical worsening versus 33% in the placebo arm, and the Kaplan-Meier plot of this is shown to the right. What were the components of this composite endpoint? This is shown over here. The numbers I mentioned to you already. Hospitalization, 11% in the inhaled troprostanol group versus almost 15% in the placebo arm. Decrease in the six minute walk distance, 8% versus 16% in the placebo arm. No difference in mortality. And then two patients had a lung transplant in the inhaled troprostanol group. Hazard ratio for this composite endpoint was significant at 0.61. Time to exacerbation of the underlying lung disease in health troprostanol resulted in a 34% reduction in the risk of exacerbation of the underlying lung disease. The absolute numbers are shown here, 26% versus 38%, and the Kaplan-Meier plot is shown to the right. Safety, treatment was well tolerated. The safety profile was consistent with prior studies of inhaled troprostanol. Most of these events were mild to moderate in intensity. Um, there were equivalent number of patients who had to stop treatment who received inhaled troprostanol as well as placebo. Serious AEs occurred in equivalent numbers, 23% versus 25% in the two groups. Here's a summary of the adverse events. Um, not unexpected, these patients had cough. Many of them probably had cough at baseline, but the placebo corrected difference in, in cough was only around 10%. Many of these side, effect, side effects are the known side effects of prostanoids. Interestingly, the patients who received, received inhaled troprostanol had less dyspnea and less of an increase in the NT pro BMP reported as an adverse event, 5% versus 15%. This was an interesting um, study or result that came out of our safety analysis. We got PFTs to make sure that we, there wasn't any deleterious effect of the inhaled troprostanol on lung function. But in actual fact, uh, a very pleasant surprise is that it went the other way in favor of the inhaled troprostanol. The, the group who got inhaled troprostanol actually had an increase um, compared to the placebo arm. If one looks at the absolute change, this was 28 cc's and 44 cc's at weeks eight and 16 respectively. Whereas this wasn't significant based on the MLs, it was significant based on percent predicted. This is a busy table, but I, I do want to highlight a few things. This looks at the subgroups who, with RIP and IPF in terms of the FEC change. If one looks at the placebo corrected difference in FEC at week 16 for the RIP group, it was 46 cc's, 46 cc's and 108 cc's at week 16. For the IPF group, it was 84 cc's 
at week eight and 168 cc's at week 16, once again favoring the inhaled troposinol group versus the placebo arm. Additional safety endpoints, there were no clinically relevant treatment related changes in pulse ox or need for supplement, supplemental oxygen. There wasn't, as mentioned, any deleterious effect on PFTs. The median improvements in the FVC I alluded to previously on the last slide, so I'm not going to get into these numbers in any great detail. You can see them once again shown over here. So in conclusion, increase is the largest and most comprehensive study of this patient group to date. Patients experienced significant improvements in exercise capacity with effects sustained throughout the 16-week treatment period. Patients also demonstrated improvements in other clinically meaningful outcomes, including improvements in the nt pro -BMP and the decreased risk of clinical worsening, as well as a decreased risk of exacerbations of the underlying lung disease. The treatment was well tolerated. There was no evidence of worsened oxygenation or lung function, so there were no concerns about uh, any potential BQ mismatching. There was the evidence of an improvement in the FEC, as I alluded to already. So these results support an additional treatment avenue and might herald a shift in the clinical management of patients with interstitial lung disease. In conclusion, I would like to thank all the increased investigators and study personnel, and especially to all the patients who participated in this very important clinical trial. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, this was an outstanding presentation and outstanding results. You can imagine that I personally am very excited because this is a field where I work on. So a lot of questions are coming in. Obviously, one of the big questions in this subject area is always, the, uh, does it really make a difference if someone can walk 30 meters more or not? So uh, particularly ILD doctors would ask that question. And I think there is a question that came in in that context, uh, which was uh, how would you reconcile the effect on the six minute walk distance with uh, the lag of an effect on the SGRQ, the quality of life? So I think just to put it in perspective, thank you, Martin, for, for your kind words about the presentation and the study results. And I do, I do want to thank all my co-investigators to sponsor the uh, participating patients especially and the study coordinators for enabling the study, which has been a long time coming. I think that the result was uh, uh, in the six minute walk test was both statistically significant as well as clinically meaningful. Uh, just to put it in appropriate uh, context, we got 21 meters based on the primary analysis. We did two other analyses and it came out to around 31 meters using less conservative statistical approaches. Um, if you look at the original study of inhaled troposinol for PAH, and this was published in Jack in 2010, the difference in the six minute walk at 12 weeks was uh, 20 meters. Uh, so more or less exactly in the same ballpark in terms of the difference there. And that was enough to get inhaled troposinol approved and registered for use here in the USA. Um, I think that, uh, so I think this is, is really quite meaningful. Uh, also remember that uh, we used a conservative statistical analysis and there were certainly patients who improved more than the 20 or 30 meters who, who as a result of, of the medication. I think what also differentiates the study is that we hit the one of the secondary endpoints, an important secondary end endpoint of time to clinical worsening. I think the St. George's uh, is a, a good question. One has to bear in mind this, that this was only a 16 week study in all the other studies of ILD, we've never really impacted on quality of life measures. And I would say that the St. George's, which everyone knows was originally designed for COPD, is perhaps not the best instrument to use in an ILD pH study. So uh, I think everything uh, pointed in the right direction, aside from the quality of life measure. Um, you know, we had the NT probium peer biomarker also uh, showing the same thing. So I think the results uh, turned out very well in the context of the study. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering whether the question about the biology of the FVC effect is coming up and it came up four times now. So that would be my question too. So this is very interesting, right? So that the FVC decline is actually further stopped in this patient population. And that's uh, quite similar to the sildenafil nintelonib trial I have published a year ago. And uh, the question is really whether targeting the vessels in these patients with advanced ILD 
is what you believe would make that difference. Is that is that interfering like vessel biology and fiber genesis? Well, I think I knew that you would like this result because it uh, parallels exactly what you showed in the in the prior in stage study. So I think this in some ways validates what you had shown previously that targeting the pulmonary vasculature might affect fibrosis. And I, I've heard you talk on this topic and you give a very eloquent uh, discussion and rationale how the pulmonary vasculature might be important in the genesis of fibrosis, of, of IPF in particular. And um, you know what we know about IPF and the IPF lung is you have areas of angiogenesis and angi areas of angiostasis. Uh, um, and what's actually interest, even more interesting about a tree prosthenol in particular is that it does uh, as with other prostanoids, have antifibrosis uh, anti properties. It has a primary effect. It's been shown in the Blue Mouse and Mouse model, for example, that it can affect fibrosis directly. And I do like the concept of an inhaled medication, an inhaled antifibrotic potentially, because I think in the field of ILD, perhaps we haven't taken enough advantage of the inhaled route as we have in other diseases like COPD. So, uh, you know, this was a very interesting, somewhat unexpected finding. And the magnitude of the of the difference in the FEC was quite impressive, especially if you look at the IPF group. Um, in the IPF group, and uh, as I recall, there were just under 100 patients or thereabouts. Um, the difference approach what we saw with nintenanib and perfenidone, about 163 cc's at 16 weeks. And this is in the context of most of these patients being on antifibrotic therapy. So I think a very interesting finding. I think the advantage of an inhaled therapy is we can deliver higher doses to the vasculature as well versus an oral medication. So I think this was a nice ancillary finding that certainly warrants further exploration. Yeah, thanks. You, I mean, I couldn't be more enthusiastic about the results. And, uh, you know, I'm biased. I think there is a need, but there were a few uh, listeners uh, asking, is this really an unmet clinical need? Can you maybe elaborate on that a little bit from your perspective? I, I, I think I share your same bias. This is clearly a huge unmet medical uh, need. If you look at all the IPF clinical trials that have been done previously, for the most part, uh, and I exclude the, the, the in-stage study and a couple of others, the STEP study, uh, but if you look at the registrational studies for perfenidone and antenna of the two antifibrotics that are available, these included only patients with mild to moderate disease. The patients with severe disease were excluded. And I think this has um, been deleterious to the patient population as a whole, because invariably these patients will go on to develop uh, severe disease. I think these patients should be included in, 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 in future clinical trials. And the results of this, I think, attest to that, that the event rate is higher in these patients. So you can study a drug and get an answer perhaps much quicker than you would in patients who have mild to moderate disease who don't have the same event rate. Uh, you know, I kind of liken these patients who are sicker with IPF and have pulmonary hypertension to stage three, stage four lung cancer. And I think that, you know, uh, when uh, pulmonary hypertension supervenes, the longevity can be measured in months in some cases. So, yes, I definitely think that there's a huge unmet need for this patient population. Good. <clears throat> there were a few safety questions coming up here. Uh, one, I think, is very clinically relevant is, did you observe any desaturation on the walk test with uh, traprostanol? No, this was looked at, we didn't report it, but uh, you know, um, we did look at the distance saturation products, so we had oxygen saturation. We didn't see any uh, desaturation. Theoretically, once again, if you give an inhaled vasodilator, the potential, the greater potential is to improve BQ matching in actual fact, but certainly we didn't see any increased desaturation in the patients. Yeah. And another important question to understand the, the context, uh, there were a few trials <clears throat> with IPF uh, that use pH medication, like mazotentin, bosentin, uh, embrisentin, and they were not positive uh, as opposed to this one and the sildenafil trial that were more encouraging. Is there anything you would want to say to explain that? When at first you don't succeed, keep trying. But I think we, uh, we certainly saw that in IPF. I mean, we, how many trials did we have that were negative in IPF before perfenidone and antenanib? And we also had some deleterious trials in IPF, the Panther study being a very good example, the ACE study of Coumadin being another example. Uh, so, um, and if you look at the studies that were done with the ERAs, they were focused on the antifibrotic effects of the ERAs. They weren't focused on treating the pulmonary hypertension. So pulmonary hypertension wasn't looked at in any of those clinical trials. 
Um, another one that, you, that I was a, a part of was the RISE IP study, and that was not only a negative study, but a harmful study as well. So uh, very different drug, different mode of delivery, uh, some nuanced differences perhaps in the patient population, uh, but I think, you know, very clearly the, the results speak for themselves uh, in terms of not only the primary, but the many secondary endpoints that we, that we hit on. Yeah, and, and, you know, if I may add, most of these other trials were looking at milder patients, uh, as opposed to yours, which was clearly a very severe patient group. So right. a, a final question, uh, we just have a minute left or so. You are actually treating uh, a feature of patients with a complex disease rather than splitting it up into tiny little pockets of disease. It's not much different conceptually to treating progressive fibrosis with antifibrotics. You treat uh, the presence of hypertension with antihypertensive. Is that something that you would believe ILD uh, field is moving to, to look more at behavior rather than category? Uh, yes, I, I think so. It goes to the whole debate of being a lumper versus a splitter. And I think uh, certainly when we're making a diagnosis, we should split and make as accurate diagnosis as possible. But at times, in, in, t in terms of therapy, sometimes we can lump patients together, as has been seen with the progressive fibrotic phenotype. And we did this in PAH as well, where we took all group one PAH patients, be they congenital heart disease, IPAH, CTD, PAH, and we studied them all together, even though they have very differing prognoses. What we know about the ILDs is once patients develop pulmonary hypertension, they tend to follow a very similar course and trajectory. If you look at um, NSRP, for example, has a very different prognosis to IPF. But once the DL gets to less than 30 percent, it looks exactly the same as IPF in terms of the subsequent disease course. And I would hypothesize that once the DL gets to less than 30 percent, they've developed a pulmonary vascular component to their disease. So I think these different fibrotic diseases do final, find a final common path as they progress, and that's pulmonary hypertension. And yes, I think we can lump them together in terms of treatment as shown in this trial. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Stephen, and, and thanks for being a true pioneer in this field. And yes, there is a need for these patients with severe disease. The, the paper is not yet published, so you cannot read this up today, but uh, it will certainly be published very soon. And I think I so. it's in the region at the moment. Look out for it. Thank you. Thank you. We now move into our final presentation by Dr. David Badesh. The title of his talk is So Tattercept for the Treatment of Pulmonary Arterial Hypertension. After the talk, we'll have a moderated Q&A session by Dr. Stephen K. Wood. So it's a pleasure to present the results of the Pulsar study, so Tattercept for the Treatment of Pulmonary Arterial Hypertension. I'm presenting this on behalf of the steering committee members, as well as the Pulsar study investigators. These are my conflicts of interest. Pulmonary arterial hypertension is a disease of cellular proliferation and vascular remodeling. It uh, is a result of progressive structural remodeling of the small pulmonary arteries as shown here, with the consequence uh, eventually being right heart failure and death. Current therapeutic interventions uh, act via three principal pathways, including the prostacyclin pathway, endothelin pathway, and nitric oxide pathway shown here. Novel therapeutic targets uh, include calcium signaling, vasoactive peptides, neurohormonal activation, extracellular matrix, dysregulated angiogenesis, mitochondrial metabolism, inflammation, growth factors, and I'm going to focus on dysregulated signaling of the BMPR2, TGF-beta, superfamily uh, pathways. The uh, importance of uh, the BMPR2 pathway was initially described in 2000 and 2002 in three seminal studies shown here. The first two demonstrated that uh, familial uh, pulmonary hypertension was caused by mutations in the uh, bone morphogenic protein receptor. The third showed that uh, this uh, uh, importance of the BMPR uh, pathway extended uh, beyond the heritable uh, subtype and uh, applied also to other forms of pulmonary arterial hypertension. In this particular study, idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. 
Moving forward now 18 to 20 years, this study was recently published in Science Translational Medicine and shows that treatment with cetatercept in preclinical experiments improved hemodynamics, right ventricular hypertrophy, right ventricular function, and arterial arteriolar remodeling. So cetatercept has been demonstrated preclinically to act via a mechanism linked to rebalancing pro and anti-proliferative signaling pathways. This slide shows the mechanism of action of cetatercept. Cetatercept is a novel first-in-class fusion protein comprising the extracellular domain of human activin receptor type 2A linked to the FC domain of human immunoglobulin G1. Cetatercept is proposed to act uh, by rebalancing signaling between pro and anti-proliferative pathways, thereby reversing the characteristic vascular remodeling seen in pulmonary arterial hypertension. The left portion of this slide shows uh, the situation in pulmonary arterial hypertension where pro-proliferative uh, signaling uh, outweighs anti-proliferative signaling pro-proliferative signaling occurring through the active and GDF uh, pathway here with disproportionate or increased uh, signaling through SMAD 2, 3, and 4. Um, and anti-proliferative signaling being relatively um, underbalanced here uh, due to uh, diminished signaling through the BMP uh, receptor or BMP signaling pathway. On the right, uh, cetatercept is shown binding activins and uh, growth differentiation factors, uh, reducing signaling through the pro-proliferative pathway, thereby allowing increased relative signaling through the anti-proliferative BMP pathway. The Pulsar study uh, design is summarized here. It was the phase two randomized double blind placebo-controlled study comparing the efficacy and safety of cetatercept versus placebo when added to standard of care therapy for the treatment of patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. 106 patients were enrolled. Inclusion criteria included group one PAH, uh, patients in functional classes two and three, baseline right heart catheterization, pulmonary vascular resistance of greater than or equal to five wood units, a baseline six minute walk distance of 150 to 550 meters and stable background therapy with standard of care treatments, including mono, uh, double and triple therapies. And these could consist of endothelin receptor antagonists, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, a soluble guanolate cyclase stimulator and or a prostacycline therapy, including intravenous prostacycline treatment. The uh, primary treatment period was 24 weeks in duration. Patients were randomized three to three to four to placebo. In addition to standard of care therapy, cetatercept 0.3 mg per kg, uh, in addition to standard of care therapy, and cetatercept 0.7 milligrams per kilogram, in addition to standard of care therapy. Randomization was stratified by baseline WHO functional class. Following the initial uh, primary treatment period of 24 weeks, patients entered an extension uh, period of 18 months. Patients previously randomized to uh, placebo uh, were subsequently randomized to one of the two doses of cetatercept, and patients uh, previously randomized to cetatercept continued their previous doses in addition to background standard of care therapy. The trial is currently in an open label extension phase. The study enrolled 106 patients at 43 sites across eight countries around the world. Endpoints were measured as change from baseline to 24 weeks versus placebo. The primary endpoint was change in pulmonary vascular resistance and the key secondary endpoint change in six minute walk distance. Additional endpoints and analyses included change in NT pro BMP levels, change in WHO functional class, change in hemodynamics, Proportion achieving a multi-component uh, improvement measure, including functional class NT pro BMP levels and six minute walk distance. And finally, time to clinical worsening. I should note that there were too few events uh, in this time to clinical worsening endpoint to be analyzed at the time of uh, data cutoff. The statistical methods are shown here. Uh, the intention to treat uh, population included all randomized subjects and the safety set included all randomized subjects who received at least one dose of study drug. Uh, the statistical methods are summarized here, um, change from baseline measurements of 
PVR and six minute walk distance were analyzed using uh, analysis of covariance with randomization stratification factor and baseline value as uh, covariates. If the data were similar between the Cetatercept uh, treatment groups, the data were combined for comparison with the placebo group. All p-values are two-sided. P-values are nominal with the exception of the primary endpoint, that being pulmonary vascular resistance. Multiple, multiple imputation was used for missing data handling, and other endpoints were summarized using descriptive statistics and tested using analysis covariance where appropriate. All safety analyses were performed on the safety population, which in this study was the same as the intention to treat uh, study population. This slide summarizes baseline characteristics. You can see the predominance of patients were female as they have been in other studies. The average age in the upper 40s and the time since diagnosis approximately seven years, so a relatively prevalent patient population. You can see that the majority of patients had idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, 58%. There were patients in the heritable uh, uh, connective tissue disease, drug and toxin induced, and uh, associated with congenital uh, shunts uh, subgroups. Continuing with uh, baseline characteristics, you can see that the patients were roughly evenly distributed between functional class two and three at baseline. And with respect to background uh, standard of care therapy, you can see that 37% of the patients enrolled were on parenteral prostacyclines. And I wanna highlight the fact that 56% of the patients enrolled in this study were on triple background therapy. This slide shows the uh, primary endpoint, pulmonary vascular resistance uh, expressed as a change from baseline. You can see that in the placebo arm, there was relatively little change in pulmonary vascular resistance. In the lower dose cetatercept arm, pulmonary vascular resistance improved uh, uh, by negative 162 dynes. And in the higher dose cetatercept arm, it improved by 256 dynes. Both treatment arms were statistically significant as compared to uh, placebo. This is a forest plot for the patients receiving the higher dose of cetatercept, 0.7 mg per kg. And I want to highlight the fact that uh, there were treatment effects seen in patients receiving up to triple combination background uh, therapy, also uh, seen in uh, patients receiving uh, prostacyclin infusion therapy. Patients in functional class two and three showed treatment benefit, and patients with lower and higher baseline pulmonary vascular resistance showed benefit. This is a similar forest plot for the Cetatercept 0.3 uh, mix per kg uh, treatment arm. Again, showing the uh, trends toward benefit in uh, patients receiving up to triple background uh, combination therapy, patients receiving parenteral prostacyclins, patients in uh, functional classes two and three, and patients with lower versus higher baseline pulmonary vascular resistance. This slide shows results on the uh, secondary endpoint of six minute walk distance. Uh, you can see that six minute walk distance improved over the course of the 24 week study in patients receiving uh, cetatercept. This slide showing uh, combined uh, doses uh, of cetatercept versus placebo. And in the table below, you can see the placebo corrected difference 29 meters in the lower dose cetatercept arm, 21 meters in the higher dose arm. And when those uh, doses were combined, all doses, uh, 25 meter improvement in uh, placebo corrected six minute walk distance. This is an exploratory analysis done on patients receiving triple background therapy. And it shows us that Cetatercept uh, demonstrated improvement over the course of the 24 week study uh, versus uh, patients receiving uh, background therapy alone. And uh, the table at the bottom shows, again, the placebo-corrected uh, differences, 40 meters in the lower dose arm, 35 meters in the higher dose arm. And when the dose arms were combined, a 37 meter uh, placebo-corrected improvement in six minute walk distance. This slide shows uh, results across a number of exploratory uh, endpoints, exploratory analyses, uh, including NT-pro-BMP levels, um, which showed a uh, 
negative 51% change with cetatercept. Um, also right atrial pressure uh, improving as well as uh, pulmonary arterial pressure. There was little difference seen in cardiac output. Uh, there's a trend toward improvement in WHO functional class um, in patients receiving cetatercept, 12.5% uh, improved in the placebo arm versus 23% uh, in those receiving cetatercept. The multi-component improvement uh, index improved in 3% of the patients receiving placebo in addition to standard of care therapy, and in 38% of patients receiving cetatercept in addition to standard of care therapy. This slide shows a treatment emergent uh, adverse events, and you can see that they were relatively evenly distributed across the uh, uh, study groups. Serious treatment emergent adverse events occurred uh, more frequently in the higher dose cetatercept arm. Um, summarized here in the footnote are the uh, uh, nature of these uh, treatment of emergent uh, adverse events. Uh, there was one death in the higher uh, dose of cetatercept uh, arm, and this uh, was due to cardiac arrest and deemed unrelated to study treatment. Uh, the patient had a number of pre existing factors that may have contributed. Uh, to their uh, death. This slide shows uh, treatment emergent adverse events of special interest. We were particularly interested in the hematologic uh, side effects, including thrombocytopenia and increases in hemoglobin levels. You can see that these side effects were more common in the higher dose of cetatercept uh, treatment to arm. Uh, this was not a surprise. Um, we were prepared to manage uh, increases in hemoglobin with uh, uh, dose interruption or dose reduction if necessary. And uh, uh, phlebotomy was also an option if, uh, if needed. I want to tell you, though, that the, um, the magnitude of these uh, changes were uh, relatively small overall. Um, you can see that the change from baseline and uh, hemoglobin concentration uh, in the higher dose of cetatercept arm was 1.5 grams per deciliter. Um, the platelet counts are shown here, and the uh, change from baseline in platelet count in the higher dose uh, cetatercept arm was a negative uh, 12. Um, shown here are treatment emergent uh, adverse events that occurred in greater than or equal to 10% of all patients in any arm, and they included headache, diarrhea, peripheral edema, dizziness, fatigue, hypokalemia, and nausea. To summarize the results of the Pulsar study, um, the Pulsar study achieved the objectives of demonstrating improvement in pulmonary vascular resistance and six minute walk distance at week 24 versus placebo. Subgroup analyses favored cetatercept at both dose levels and in patients receiving mono, double, and triple therapy um, as background uh, treatment. Concordance of results uh, was seen across multiple study endpoints. Cetatercept was generally well tolerated in subjects with PAH, with a safety profile consistent with that observed in other patient populations. Cetatercept has a novel mechanism of action, rebalancing pro and anti proliferative signaling through a pathway distinct from the previously approved uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension therapies. Proof of concept has been demonstrated, and a phase three program is planned. We'd like to thank all of the patients, their families, and the Pulsar study investigators who participated in the trial. The study was sponsored by Acceleron Pharma, and the authors received editorial assistance from Intercom, and that was supported by Acceleron. Thanks very much, and I would be happy to take any questions. Dr. Battish, uh, thank you very much for that interesting presentation. Um, we have several questions rolling in. Uh, I'd like to start uh, first one. Um, so you showed pretty robust decreases in NT pro BNP, decreases in pulmonary vascular resistance and the right atrial pressure, and increases in six minute walk distance. So it's a bit surprising that cardiac output didn't change. Um, what do you think about this? And do you have any possible explanations? Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Uh, it's a great question. I think that. Unlike other medications that have been tried in the field that have had a uh, significant pulmonary vasodilatory effect, this drug is acting largely on the structure of pulmonary blood vessels. And we 
have thought that its primary effect is likely re-remodeling of the pulmonary arteries and arterioles, um, decreasing pulmonary vascular resistance. Um, unlike other drugs that have been tested in the field, it probably has no direct inotropic effect. Um, and uh, that may explain in part why cardiac output didn't include. The other uh, thing that I would add, Steve, is that I expect that over time that finding might change. We have echocardiographic data that uh, would suggest possible improvement in right ventricular function over time, and uh, that data is still being analyzed, but, um, you know, the study was six months in duration. We're using a drug that affects vascular structure um, as opposed to vasodilatation, and it's, it's possible that we'll see an effect on cardiac output later, but I think the principal effect is within the, the small vessels of the pulmonary vascular tree. Thank you. Uh, so next question is about the molecular phenotype. Um, so do you have any data showing the direct activity of the drug on BMPR2 signaling or any data regarding the TGF beta pathway to look for treatment heterogeneity, expecting a greater effect in those with more dysfunctional TGF beta functioning? So those analyses are actually still in progress. We do have samples, um, and uh, the data will be analyzed with respect to those biomarkers and uh, gene expression. Um, I would say, though, that you know we expect expected going into the study to see effect, or we hope to see effect, in patients beyond uh, those with a heritable subtype um, with known BNPR2 mutations. And uh, the reason being that it's, it's been shown that uh, BMP signaling is abnormal or impacted in patients that don't have demonstrable BMPR2 mutations. Great. Uh, so the next question is about uh, dosing for the phase three. Uh, which dose will be selected for the phase three and on what, you know, what basis was that decision made? Yeah. Great question. You know, this drug had previously been studied in, in hematologic disorders um, and whatnot, and there was some PK modeling that occurred prior to this study. I think we were actually fortunate in terms of the dose selection um, with the 0.3 milligrams per kilogram arm and 0.7 milligrams per kilogram arm, uh, both demonstrating efficacy and uh, perhaps a hint that some patients uh, tolerate the 0.7 milligram per kilogram arm less well. Um, and uh, that being in an expected way, I think, it increased hemoglobin levels at that dose. Um, we thought that we would see that. We were prepared to manage it, um, and that being by dose-reducing patients who demonstrated a significant rise in hemoglobin levels or, um, you know, even phlebotomy if it became necessary. Um, so the, even at the higher dose, though, that you know the number of discontinuations was small. Um, the drug seemed to be well tolerated overall, with uh, an increase in hemoglobin and decrease in platelet count being the two uh, main side effects seen. And uh, I don't think that either of those are uh, surprising. Um, it's a different kind of side effect from what we see in in our other PAH therapies where we might see systemic hypotension, for example, um, and whatnot. Uh, this being an anti-proliferative compound that acts in a different way. Um, you know, we didn't find the side effects to be surprising and they did seem to be manageable. Great. Um, uh, in terms of the next step in phase three, you know, where do you see this being positioned? Could this be used in the early stage of disease or are you going to focus again on people with advanced disease on multiple therapies? Yeah. So great question. Um, you know, we were excited to see a treatment effect um, on triple background therapy, um, you know, on top of triple background therapy. Um, that's something that I don't think has been demonstrated before. And it, it uh, I think, gives us hope that maybe those patients that have uh, not responded as favorably as we'd like to uh, previously available agents might respond to this drug. Um, in that way, it might meet an, an unmet need. Um, I think that uh, where to go from here, you know, it's right now the data that we have would suggest, you know, it's add-on therapy to mono, double, or triple background therapy. 
I think you're asking, you know, could it perhaps have a place earlier in, uh, you know, treatment of the disease? That's something, you know, we're not prepared to answer based on the data that are currently available, but something that I think does deserve uh, further exploration going forward. Um, you know, could this drug as, um, perhaps have a disease modifying effect, um, in which case it might make great sense to try to employ it, you know, as early as you reasonably can. So, right. so. Uh, next question is about uh, increasing hemoglobin. Uh, was there an analysis looking at the increase in WALK as a functional of increasing hemoglobin? Could that have contributed to that finding? Yeah, that's interesting. This, this, as steering committee members, we were all interested in, in whether correction for hemoglobin levels accounted for any of the treatment effect or benefit. And um, as I recall, no, that uh, correction for hemoglobin uh, did not make a significant impact on uh, the benefit scene. Right. Um, in the forest plot, it looked like the effect might have been greater in women than in men. Um, again, these are small numbers, but do we know anything about the biology there where this might be expected to have, a, a, again, heterogeneity of treatment effect between sexes? You know, I, I think you've already answered the question, Steve, actually. You know, it was a relatively smaller, you know, 106 patient uh, study. Uh, not small for phase two, but, but, you know, it was a phase two trial. When you start breaking things down into subgroups like that, um, you know, I think we need to be careful in terms of interpreting differences, whether or not it's truly more beneficial in women than men and things. I'm, I'm not sure we're prepared to answer that based on the numbers that we have here. Yeah. Uh, another uh, question uh, about the six minute walk. Um, so it seems uh, the uh, questioner says that the MCID of the six minute walk distance of 34 meters was not met. Uh, why should I be excited about this drug based on this data? So a skeptic in the audience. <laughs> All right. So that's a great question. You know, the, the study was powered um, based on the primary endpoint, of course, the pulmonary vascular resistance. And so for six minute walk, um, the study may have been relatively underpowered, you know, entering it. Um, the uh, Interesting thing there was that we could still still see a treatment effect. How that was handled uh, statistically, actually, um, patients, if the treatment effect was similar between the two dose arms, the dose arms were combined. Okay, and in the combined uh, doses, we did see improvement in six-minute walk distance. And I'm I'm looking here. I'm going to give you the exact numbers. A placebo-corrected improvement. Um, I'm sorry. I'm not being able to just pull up the slide is a little bit less convenient, but we'll get it. Um, so, I just don't want to toss out a number here, Steve. Um, so the placebo corrected uh, improvement in six minute walk distance was 25 meters overall. Um, and in the patients receiving triple background therapy, actually, the placebo-corrected difference was 37 meters. Um, we thought that was, it was statistically significant, although we're careful in interpreting significance among the secondary endpoints and need to be considered nominally significant. Um, but uh, in terms of whether or not this is a clinically important difference, it's greater than was seen in some other trials uh, where therapies were tested on background therapy. Um, and, uh, you know, a 25 meter improvement overall, 37 meters in patients on triple background therapy, we actually thought was um, a good uh, effect. Um, as was presented, you could see that the placebo arm demonstrated some increase in six minute walk over the uh, um, 24 week study period overall. I think that made the placebo-corrected difference a little bit smaller. That's obviously why we do placebo-corrected studies, uh, yeah. placebo-controlled studies. But um, we thought, based on the size of the study, that that was actually a, a relatively impressive effect. So. I guess hard to know what an MCID is in this specific population rather than an untreated population. Yeah, I think, you know, that, that data, the uh, minimally important clinical difference, uh, you know, that information has been obtained in, in patients that are less heavily treated, I think, than 
this population was in general. Sure. So. Um, uh, I have a question about dropouts. Um, how many dropouts yep. and how much retention did you have? And people seem to tolerate yep. administration and other things. So it's a good question. Um, there were six AEs that led to treatment discontinuation, and they included uh, increased shortness of breath, polycythemia, decreased white blood cell count, an increase in red blood cell count, thrombocytopenia, and one instance of cardiac arrest. Um, so in the placebo arm, that was actually the patient that experienced increased shortness of breath. Um, in the 0.3 milligram per kilogram cetatercept arm, uh, there was one patient that developed polycythemia and another who experienced a decrease in white blood cell count. In the 0.7 milligram per kilogram cetatercept arm, uh, there was a patient that demonstrated red blood cell increase this was actually the highest hemoglobin seen. It was 18 uh, grams per deciliter. Uh, the patient returned to 16 grams per deciliter after eight weeks. Um, and then a thrombocytopenia event. And uh, this patient actually had uh, grade one thrombocytopenia at baseline. Uh, the lowest platelet count reached was 55,000. It recovered to 120,000 after eight weeks. And we did not see any bleeding events. I think that's important to note. And then the patient that experienced a cardiac arrest was in the 0.7 milligram per kilogram cetatercept arm. And that patient had a number of underlying um, other risk factors, including systemic hypertension, type 2 diabetes, COPD, hyperlipidemia, atrial fibrillation, some congestive heart disease, and ischemic heart disease. And one might ask, well, did that patient meet the entry criteria? They did, but they had this kind of uh, conglomeration of other um, underlying disease states that might have contributed to the uh, cardiopulmonary arrest. So, Thank um, you. Thank you very much. I, I think we're out of time, yep. and thanks to everyone for your questions. Thank you. Appreciate it, Steve. Thank you all so much for joining us. I know I really enjoyed this. Obviously, we all wish it could have happened uh, in Philadelphia as we had planned, but I still think this virtual session was great, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. As a reminder, ATS 2020 virtual will be held on August 5th through the 10th. To learn more about our sessions and other conference-related content, please go to conference.thoracic.org.